Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to have Jean Bauer of the Farm Sanctuary here today at Google New York. Jean currently serves as president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. From humble beginnings selling veggie dogs at Grateful Dead concerts to fun animal rescues, Farm Sanctuary has become the nation's leading farm animal protection group. Over the past 25 years, Jean has visited hundreds of farms and has really become a pioneer in the field of undercover investigations. He's also educated millions in the process. Jean's achievements include winning the first ever cruelty conviction at a U.S. stockyard, as well as introducing the first U.S. laws to prohibit cruel farming confinement methods. Jean holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from California State University, and also a master's degree in agricultural economics from Cornell. In 2008, Jean released a national bestseller, Farm Sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Food and Animals. We still have a few copies in the back that are free if you'd like to have one, and he can also stick around to sign autographs. And on a personal note, I had a chance to visit the New York Farm Sanctuary last summer and was just so impressed to see their work with the abused and abandoned animals and left feeling very inspired. Uh, so please help me in joining wel and welcome Jean Bauer to the stage. Thank you very much. Wow, well, thank you so much. And, and thank you for being here and for your interest in these issues. Um, you know, most of us don't think very much about what happens to animals that are being raised on farms. And most of us would be shocked to learn. And so I'll be talking about some of that. I will also be talking about some of the positive stories, some of the experiences we've had over the years. And uh, so I'll start with some pictures of the animals at the sanctuary. Um, at Farm Sanctuary, the animals are our friends, not our food. We treat them like most people treat their cats and dogs. Cows get to be who they are. They get to go outside. They get to exercise. They get to um, graze. Pigs get to go out and root in the soil. Pigs are very earthy animals. They have very sensitive noses, so they can smell things under the earth. But they also have very powerful noses. Uh, farmers used to put corn around tree stumps, and the pigs would go there and root up <laughs> these old tree stumps. So their noses are very powerful. But they're very sensitive. And when you think about these animals living in these factory farms where for 24 hours a day, all they're doing is breathing in the noxious fumes of their own waste, it makes that kind of confinement even that much more upsetting. And when the animals first come to farm sanctuary, oftentimes they're very frightened. Uh, they've only known cruelty to human hands. But as time goes, they learn to trust us. They learn to enjoy life. They learn to play and experience pleasure and joy for the first time. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And they also show companionship and friendship. That's a picture of Lydia, who we used to call the hugging turkey, because she'd go out into the barnyard and kneel down. And she would walk over to you and crane her neck around your neck like she was giving you a hug. So I've spent a lot of time at the farm over the past 25 years, uh, enjoying the company of these animals and watching people being touched and inspired by these animals. And it's a, a beautiful thing. But I didn't grow up on a farm. I actually grew up in Hollywood, California. I had a cat named Tiger who I totally loved. And although I loved Tiger and I loved the other, far, or the other animals I knew, dogs and cats, I was still eating other animals. And I didn't really put them together. But as time went, I started recognizing that I didn't have to eat animals. And I realized as I grew up, I never really made a conscious choice to eat animals. It was something everybody around me was doing, so I just started doing it. And I think most of us you know, live our lives in a way where we just sort of do things that other people around us are doing. It's just kind of what we do. We're very social animals. We learn from those around us. And so my parents were eating animals, my brothers and sisters. Everybody I knew was. So I did it without really thinking about it. But as time went and I started recognizing that I didn't have to eat animals and that these animals had feelings much like cats and dogs and that it was healthier, I went vegan in 1985. And you know, I got a couple slides here talking about the health impacts. And there's a book called The China Study that I would recommend for anybody interested in the science behind the benefits of plant-based eating. But this sh just shows the health care expenditures per person in the US versus other countries. And they're very high in this country, uh, partly because of the system, but also largely because of the way we eat and because we're not as healthy as we could be. And sadly, our health care expenditures continue increasing. 
Uh, there's a movie out right now called Forks Over Knives that I would recommend if you haven't seen it. And it, the experts in that movie estimate that we could save 70 to 80 percent on our health care costs in this country by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet, shifting away from processed food, shifting away from animal food. So the way we eat has profound impacts not only on other animals, but on our own health. And when we eat in a way uh, that we do in this country, we're seeing huge problems. Heart disease and cancer are the top two killers. The risks of both can be seriously lessened by shifting towards a plant-based diet. Another impact animal agriculture has is on the environment. And these are some quotes from a, the, a United Nations study called Livestock's Long Shadow. And as you see here, talks about how the livestock industry is a major contributor to the mo most significant environmental problems we're facing. It's a major player responsible for contributing more to greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation industry. So if you take all the cars and trains and boats and planes and combine the emissions, it would be less than what comes from animal agriculture. And this is according to the United Nations. According to the UN, uh, the livestock sector should be a major policy focus when dealing with problems of land degradation, climate change and air pollution, water shortage, water pollution, and loss of biodiversity. The contribution is on a massive scale, and the contribution to the solution could be huge. Now, unfortunately, agribusiness is very entrenched in politics. They've invested for years in the legislative process, and they have a lot of control. Uh, back in the 1970s, there was a report that went out uh, that encouraged Americans to eat, eat less meat. Now, that report was in print for about a day, and then it was changed and reworded to say, we should eat more meat that is lower in saturated fat, which, you know, mixes up the message and has the ultimate result of people eating more meat. We've continued doing that, and our health has suffered as a result. Another cost of animal agriculture has to do with energy use. This is a slide from a New York Times article that was entitled Rethinking the Meat Guzzler, and it com compares the amount of fossil fuels needed for a vegetarian meal versus a meat meal, and it took 16 times more fossil fuels for the meat meal. And all these problems have been exacerbated over the years by this move away from small farms towards larger industrialized operations. The number of farms in our country has been decreasing. The size of each farm has been increasing. So we don't have the, the typical uh, family farm that many of us envision anymore. We have these industrialized operations. Now, when Farm Sanctuary started in 1986, I spent a lot of time going to stockyards and farms and slaughterhouses to document what was happening. And this is a picture taken at Lancaster Stockyard, which was at the time the largest stockyard east of Chicago. Um, cows, pigs, sheep, goats would be transported here to be sold. They were seen as a pillar of the, oops. The animals, when they were being handled at these stockyards, were often seen just as commodities. And what became apparent was the way I looked at these animals and the way that these livestock people looked at the animals was very different. I would look into the animals' faces, I would see their expressions, I would recognize that they were afraid. The handlers were not looking into the animals' faces, they're literally looking at cuts of meat, they're looking at body conformation, they're looking at meat on the hoof and they sell them by the pound. So it was a very different perspective. And when these animals are seen just as commodities, they're oftentimes whipped, they're beaten, they're shocked, living animals are thrown away. Uh, Animals die routinely in the process. That's a picture of the dead pile behind the stockyard. And the day I took this picture, there were dead pigs, dead cows, dead sheep. Um, and as I approached, you know, the maggots were so thick you could hear them buzzing. It was a hot August day, and the stink was horrible as you can imagine. And the sheep at the far right was actually alive. She lifted her head. And as you can imagine, we were stunned to find a living animal thrown in this dead pile. Took her off the dead pile, brought her to a nearby veterinarian thinking she would have to be euthanized. But she stood up and she lived with us for more than 10 years. So that's Hilda, our first rescued animal. And since her, we've rescued thousands. And each of these animals becomes an ambassador. When people learn where Hilda came from and where these animals, the way these animals suffer in this industry, it's, it's, uh, it can be a very transformative experience, especially when you get to know these animals at Farm Sanctuary, like many people know their cats and dogs and hearing about their stories. 
So we began a campaign at Lancaster Stockyards after there was no movement on prosecuting the stockyard for leaving this downed animal on the dead pile. And our position was that if an animal is too sick to walk, that animal should be humanely euthanized or should be given proper veterinary care. They should not just be left to suffer on a dead pile. They shouldn't be left to suffer and die in the alleyways, which was also commonly happening. But at the time, Lancaster Stockyards was seen as a pillar of the community. It was getting ready to celebrate its 100-year anniversary. And it was being criticized now by this uh, group of vegans who lived in a school bus on a tofu farm that funded the organization by selling vegetarian hot dogs at Grateful Dead concerts. So we had a lot of convincing to do in the community. But as time went, and as people started seeing these images of animals left for dead, and they started hearing about what was happening, things ultimately shifted. We were able to get Lancaster Stockyards convicted of cruelty to animals after seven years of campaigning. I went back to the stockyard a few years ago, took that picture. It was overgrown. It's now been bulldozed. It's gone. We actually had an event there last year at the Stockyard Inn, which is right next to the Stockyard. It was a vegan event to celebrate Hilda's 25th, the 25th anniversary of Hilda's rescue. And so the Stockyard owner said that and he was a little bit worried at first, having all these vegans come to the Stockyard Inn. But he agreed that he would host this event. And he said that it was a very positive experience, that he learned a lot about it, that this is the wave of the future. And from now on, he's going to have a vegan item on his menu. And while st the stockyard is now gone, Farm Sanctuary has grown. That's our farm in Watkins Glen, New York. And you're all invited, in fact, encouraged to come visit, get to know the animals, uh, experience that, uh, what happens to them when they're transformed. And this is our farm in Orland, California. It's north of Sacramento. We recently also acquired a farm near Los Angeles. And all of these are open to visitors. And we encourage people to come, get to know the animals, and look into their eyes and recognize that they're really not that different than the cats and dogs who, we, who many of us live with. But far away from farm sanctuary on farms all over this country, bad has become normal. Farm animals are genetically manipulated, artificially bred, mutilated, confined, cruelly beaten, then killed for food. Those might sound like harsh words, but it's very accurate and descriptive. Farm animals are specifically excluded from the Federal Animal Welfare Act. You know, most people believe and want to believe that these animals are protected, right? Well, no, they're not. They're excluded from the Federal Animal Welfare Act. And when it comes to state laws, agricultural practices considered to be common are excluded. And a common practice is one that the industry has adopted year after year. So if you, everybody's starting to put animals in small cages where they can't turn around, if everybody is cutting off the tails of animals without any anesthesia, if everybody is leaving live animals on piles of dead animals, it's a common practice and it's legal in most states. And to give you a sense also of how powerful agribusiness is, it's exempt from many labor and environmental laws. So this is an industry that treats animals badly, that harms the environment, that is producing food that is killing us, and they're not responsible or not liable for many of these harms. I recently heard about how some of the attorneys that went after the tobacco industry uh, are now starting to look at the food industry and looking at these kinds of issues. There's a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, information that needs to be gathered and, and, and the case made, but I think that's a very positive sign. This is an industry that does a lot of harm, and most people are unwittingly supporting it and unwittingly harming themselves. A big part of our message at Farm Sanctuary is we encourage people to make choices in, the, in our lives that are aligned with our own values and aligned with our own interests. So instead of when the factory farming issue comes up, instead of saying, don't tell me I don't want to know, which a lot of people do, I think it's sensible to be more responsible and say, look, I want to know and I want to feel good about what I'm doing. I want to live in a way that I can feel good about instead of living in this sort of dissonance and denial. And the other thing is we encourage people to make food choices that are aligned with our interests. To eat food that is healthy, not to eat food that gives us heart disease and, and, and can ultimately kill us over time and cause enormous suffering to ourselves and our loved ones. Um, and that means eating more plant foods in our country, more whole foods, less processed foods. So, if we make choices that are aligned with our values and aligned with our interests, we will see a revolution in this food business. And most citizens you know, don't think enough about these issues and are unwittingly supporting this bad system. 
So after Lancaster Stockyards was convicted of cruelty, I traveled around the country uh, documenting more downed animals. That's a picture I took in Southern California. These are downed cows that were being used for human food, being slaughtered for food. That's a picture I took in Texas. This cow was sent to the stockyard with her calf. And because cows and calves sell to different buyers, they were separated. The mother fought to be with her calf, and as she did, her neck was broken. She was left there for hours, possibly for days. They refused to euthanize her because as long as she was still alive, she could be sold for food. And that's a picture I took at a stockyard in upstate New York. It was a freezing day. This calf was sent to the stockyard on the day he was born. He was still wet from afterbirth, and he was dying of hypothermia. I went up to the stockyard worker and I asked, what's going on with this calf? And he said, I have to bury him tomorrow. So I said, well, what if I take him off your hands? He said, sure, go ahead, take him. So I took the calf to a nearby veterinarian. She tried to take his temperature. It was so low, it wouldn't even read on the thermometer. And she said, what are you wasting your time for? This calf has very low chance of survival, makes no economic sense. It's going to cost a lot more than he's worth to do this. And I said, you know, to me, this calf is not an economic unit. He's an individual. I want to do what I can to help him. And she finally gave him intravenous fluids, and I took him back to the sanctuary. And I'm happy to say he recovered. That's a picture of Opie in his prime. He ended up weighing close to 3,000 pounds. He lived a long life at the farm, lived to be 18 years old. And it was a beautiful thing to see his transformation. You know, as he started healing physically, that was a good thing. But he still wasn't really thriving. And when I took him out to the barn to be with the other cows, and they welcomed him in, that's when he started thriving. And it really speaks to the fact that these animals, in addition to having physical needs, have emotional needs. And they need to be with their own people. They need to be in a positive environment. So just like humans are affected by our social environment, animals are affected by their social environment. In a slaughterhouse or in a factory farm where it's about brutality and exploitation and cruelty, that affects the animals and it affects the people. And at the sanctuary, where it's about caring and nurturing and, and kindness, that affects the animals. And it also affects people. But Opie was born on a dairy farm. In order for a cow to have milk, she has to have a calf, just like other mammals. We don't lactate in, unless there's a baby to feed. That's usually how it works. So dairy cows today have a calf every year. The calf is taken away immediately after birth, and the cow is put in these milking parlors where they're hooked up to machines two to three times a day, and they're milked intensely. They'll produce about 10 times more milk than they would in a natural environment. Their bodies are under intense stress. I remember reading in an agribusiness journal a few years back how for a dairy cow, with the amount of production they do, and in addition to giving 10 times more milk than normal, they're pregnant during most of their lactation period. So there's this enormous drain on their bodies. Um, they're in what's called a state of negative energy balance. They cannot eat enough to keep the weight on their bones, so they're losing weight during this process. Um, but I re read in an industry journal that for a dairy cow, it's like running a marathon every day. So they're pushed very hard. In a healthy environment, they could live 20 years. On modern dairy farms, they're sent to slaughter after just about three or four years in production. And in many cases, those cows are so weak they can't even stand, and they become these downed animals. Like that first picture I showed of the slaughterhouse in Southern California, those were all dairy cows who were too sick even to walk, and they were dragged onto trucks, taken to slaughter to be used for food. This picture was actually taken by a dairy industry veterinarian in California who was upset by what he was seeing, took that picture, sent it to me, and said, this is wrong. We've got to do something about it. So we were able to pass legislation in California. I'm happy to say it is now illegal federally for downed cows to be slaughtered and used for human food. Part of that is for humane reasons, but part of it also is for concerns about mad cow disease. Uh, the first uh, animal discovered to have mad cow disease in the US was a downed cow. So the health concerns and the animal welfare concerns led ultimately to a ban on the slaughter of downed cattle for human food, so that's positive. But other downed animals, including pigs and sheep and goats that are too sick to walk, are still dragged onto trucks and taken to slaughter and used for food. 
It's also interesting to note that the U.S. Department of Agriculture explicitly allows animals who are diseased to be used for human food. During the process of trying to ban down cows in the food supply, we sued the USDA and we argued that diseased animals should not be used for food. Their response to us was that we were incorrect, that it was legal and common and appropriate for diseased animals to be used for food. So whether they're downed or not, diseased animals are still used for food. Now, as I mentioned, for a dairy cow to have milk, she has to have a calf. The calf is taken away immediately after birth. The female calves are raised to become milking cows. The male calves are useless to the dairy industry. So the veal industry was actually created to take advantage of this plentiful supply of unwanted male calves born on dairy farms. And these calves are chained by the neck in these crates for their whole lives. As people have learned what happens to calves in veal production, veal consumption in the US has started going down. It's a very positive step, and it shows that most people are humane. Most people don't like to support cruelty. When people learn about this stuff, they can take steps to stop supporting it and to eat in a way that's more aligned with our own values. But veal calves are not the only animals that are confined in these kind of crates. Uh, that's a picture I took in Missouri. These are sows that are kept in what are called gestation crates. These are two foot wide metal enclosures uh, where they live most of their lives. And they're called gestation crates because it's where they're kept during their gestation period or their pregnancy, which lasts four months. They suffer both physically and psychologically. This one you can see has some bruising on her front leg. This one is engaging in what's called bar biting. It's a stereotypical neurotic coping behavior that these animals engage in in an attempt to um, survive their confinement. And they're basically driven mad. And the third confinement system I'll mention has to do with chickens that are used in egg production. This is a picture of a battery cage operation. These egg-laying hens are lined up in rows, stacked in tiers, in huge factory warehouses that'll hold 100,000 birds. They're packed so tightly they can't even stretch their wings. They constantly scrape against the wire bars of their cages. Their feathers wear off. They end up with bruises and abrasions on their bodies and they'll live this way for about a year. After that time, they're sent to slaughter. But because they're so skinny and because they're so beat up, a lot of times the slaughterhouses don't want them. So sometimes they're just killed on the farm. Sometimes they're literally ground up alive. There was a case in California where an egg factory had 30,000 spent hens. That's what they call them after their egg production cycle and they're no longer profitable. They're called spent hens. So he had 30,000 spent hens he had to get rid of. He couldn't find a slaughterhouse to take them, so he got a wood chipper. And he was throwing these live birds into the wood chipper. A neighbor saw this, was upset about it, called us, called the other authorities. We tried to get something done about it, and it was considered to be an acceptable, common agricultural practice. So he was not found guilty of cruelty to animals. And one of the people that came forward to defend this and say it was okay was a veterinarian with the American Veterinary Medical Association. So you have these institutions that are looked upon as experts who have bought into a situation where bad has become normal and they start defending practices that most people, when they think about them, uh, don't feel very good about. Now I mentioned that these spent hens are useless to the meat industry or a very low value to the meat industry. That's because today we are raising chickens in huge numbers for meat, and they're a very distinct breed. They've been genetically bred to grow twice as big and twice as fast as normal. Um, the egg-laying hens do not grow very big or very fast. So when you're at the hatchery, and this is a picture of a hatchery, and they're hatching the egg-laying hens, you have both males and females that hatch. The females are used for egg production. The males are useless. So what happens? That's a picture I took behind a hatchery in Pennsylvania. These are the unwanted male chicks that were thrown away the day they hatched. And what an irony, you know? The egg, sort of a symbol of spring and birth, and they fight their way out into this world to be thrown in a trash can. That is uh, at another hatchery, and these are live chicks thrown in a manure spreader, spread on the field literally like manure. And that's a picture I took at an egg factory in New Jersey. I was there to document the battery cages 
And as I was getting ready to leave, I came across this trash can full of these birds. I thought they were all dead, but as I got closer, a couple of them started moving. Uh, so I took them out of the trash can and brought them to Farm Sanctuary. And uh, we tried to prosecute that egg factory for cruelty to animals, for leaving live birds in a trash can. Their lawyer argued in court that they could legally treat the birds like manure. And the judge said, isn't there a difference between live birds and manure? Their lawyer said, no, there's not a difference. And they were found not guilty of cruelty to animals. Just gives you a sense of how bad has become normal, how weak the law is, and how this industry gets away with such blatant mistreatment. And it reminds me of a quote from Ruth Harrison who wrote Animal Machines. So I think that's the situation today, where we have this system that is become normalized, institutionalized. And not only has this the case in the field and in communities where animals are being raised for food, but in our society generally. We eat in a way that supports the system. And then, you know, we have health problems. And you know, a lot of us know people that are on heart medication when they get to a certain way, age, and then that becomes normal. If they're on heart medication and they're on heart medication, we all must be faced for, for that future. This is what everybody deals with, right? Well, you know, my dad had a heart attack um, about 15 years ago now. And he went to the hospital, and they were feeding him bacon and eggs. It killed me, you know? And then, so my dad then started reading about this. And he's not a vegan, but he's eating a lot less animal foods. And, that's a, and his health has improved significantly. And then I'm 50 now, so a few years back I figured I'm kind of getting old. I should go to the hospital and see how my health is. And I went in, and the doctor was taking all these notes, any d record of heart disease in the family. I said, yeah, my heart, dad had a heart attack. And one of the first things he said to me after that, without taking any tests or anything, was, well, I might want to put you on heart medication. Whoa. And then I didn't go back to that doctor. I went to somebody else, and I said, take my blood. And they did. And they analyzed it. And Everything was in the normal ranges, except for one statistic that was outside the normal, and that was the bad cholesterol, and it was below the normal. So I thought that that was a good thing. So even in the medical profession, you have doctors and experts who mean well, but who have, I think, been sort of acculturated to accept certain things. That, well, at a certain age, most people need heart medication, is one of these kind of beliefs and assumptions that we operate by. And I think it's something that needs to be challenged. I had mentioned how we have two distinct breeds of chickens in this country. I showed you how the egg-laying hens are kept. This is how the chickens who are raised for meat are kept, just in these massive warehouses. They grow twice as big, twice as fast as normal. They grow so fast, their hearts and lungs have a hard time supporting their bodies. Every year, millions die of heart attacks before they go to slaughter at like six weeks old. But it's still profitable because we raise about 9 billion of these chickens every year. So the industry can afford to lose hundreds of millions because they're growing twice as fast as normal, and it's still profitable. And these birds' overweight condition, where their hearts and lungs cannot support that sort of uh, growth, somewhat perversely parallels our own problems in this country now with obesity. I've got a series of slides here now from the Centers for Disease Control showing the rates of obesity in the US. Starting in 1985 with the darker blue states there, indicating uh, 10 to 14 percent of the adult population obese. By 1990, we see it spreading. By 95, we have a new darker blue color indicating 15 to 19 percent of the adult population obese. By 2000, we now have a new, co new color indicating more, uh, a higher percentage with uh, obesity. 2006, the last uh, one I have available here, indicating even more so. So this is a problem that has spread. It's been recognized now as an epidemic in our country. And it's, I think, the beginning of a process of change. And I am very happy with what Michelle Obama is doing, talking about eating more fruits and vegetables, having a White House organic garden. And amazingly, she's been criticized for that. It's crazy. Uh, also, down in Washington, D.C., at the USDA building, there's actually something called the People's Garden. It's a garden, 
and, and the, it's a very important, I think, symbolic gesture that we need to take control more of our food choices and eat in a way that we feel good about instead of doing what we have done before just because we have done it before. You know, this is really what this boils down to, thinking about how we're eating, thinking about how we're living, and asking ourselves how we feel about it, and then making choices that we can really feel good about, and then eating food that is good for us, and that does not support an agricultural system that is destroying the planet like animal agriculture is today. Now, when we first got the farm in Watkins Glen, New York, one of our first visitors was a pig farmer. And he came over to the farm, and I was talking with him, in the pig barn. And he looked out and saw these young volunteers, maybe weighed 100 pounds each, taking care of these 500-pound sows, cleaning up after them. And this pig farmer was stunned. He said that those animals are dangerous. They're aggressive. You better get out of that barn, or they're going to attack you. And I told him that you know, we had never had these pigs attacking us the way he was describing. Um, and he said, look, I'm a pig farmer. I know these animals. I've raised them for years. I understand them. You can't trust them. And to make his point, he talked about how he had a sow who had piglets. And he took her piglets away. And she came after him. And he didn't recognize that his action caused that response. So sometimes we become so narrow-minded and we start acting in a way and thinking in a way that is so limited that we don't recognize how our own behaviors cause certain impacts. And, and that was the case with this pig farmer. And you know, when the animals do come to farm sanctuary, as I mentioned, oftentimes they very, are very frightened because they've only known cruelty at human hands. And so when we go into the barn, they will be defensive and they will step back. But as time goes, they learn to trust us. They know they're in a safe place. And, um, and, and it becomes a positive experience for them. And also for us, when animals are treated badly, we don't want to see ourselves as mean. So we then start coming up with rationalizations and justifications for why we have to do this. So this pig farmer, for instance, said those are aggressive animals. You have to put them in the crates. Otherwise, they'll attack you or they'll attack other animals. So that's a justification based on this assumption that these animals are mean. Another justification that is made is that these sows are not able to raise their young. So we have to put them in these crates in order to protect the babies from the mothers. They actually believe that. They needed to put them in a, this is a farrowing crate, which is where the sows give birth. And they have space to stand up and lay down. And the piglets can nurse through the bars when the mother lays down. And the pig industry says they have to do this to protect the babies, which is some completely counterintuitive that a mother pig or a mother animal of any species can't raise their young, but this is something they actually believe. It's kind of ludicrous when you think about it, but this is what they really believe. Now, a couple years ago, there were floods in Iowa, and we sent a team out there to rescue some animals. Um, many, sadly, died in their crates and never got out of these factory farms, but some did. One of them was a sound named Nikki, who was pregnant. She had been in the gestation crate, and she got out of the farm. She got onto a levee to give birth, you know, amidst all this flooding, our people were able to find her and her babies and bring them to farm sanctuary. And when we go into the barn with her, do you think she attacks us like this pig farming was describing? That's her with her babies, and that's her with Susie, our shelter director. She's not attacking us. She knows she's in a safe place. You know, these animals are not that different than us. If you've had a positive experience with somebody, you're going to welcome that. If you've had a negative experience with somebody, you're going to be concerned about that. And walking around farm sanctuary is a beautiful thing to see. These animals literally smile. They enjoy life. And the people that raise these animals on factory farms become jaded, become used to certain things. And and these are good people in many cases just doing bad things. Could you imagine what it would be like working in a slaughterhouse where for eight hours a day all you're doing is cutting the throats of animals? I mean, that does something to you. That's a brutal, bloody existence, a violence, a violent job. And it's something that I wish nobody had to do. Um, 
We, our first campaign to challenge the confinement of animals in these factory farms was in the state of Florida back in 2000 to 2002. And I went to the director of the swine unit at the University of Florida where they had sows kept in crates. And I talked to him about our desire to protect these animals. The first thing he said to me is, what, you want to put us out of business? Again, this is sort of the assumption and the fear that he had. And I said, our goal is to prevent suffering. And then he started talking to me about all the reasons why they had to put these sows in the crates. The same reasons that this other guy who visited our farm said, well, these are aggressive animals. You've got to put them in crates to protect other animals and people. The sows you know, crush their babies. You've got to put them in these crates to protect the babies. Uh, and then he also said that uh, today it's impossible to be a farmer and to do it the old-fashioned way. You had to raise animals in these industrialized operations in order to be profitable. So these were all the assumptions he, he described. And I countered each one saying that you know, these animals don't have to be kept that way. We have a farm. The animals don't need those crates. And in terms of the idea that factory farming is the only way to make a living now, there is a burgeoning movement towards small farms, towards farmers markets. The number of farms in the U.S. has just started going back up. And it's because you have these small farms that are starting to um, to come into existence. It's a very positive trend. So I was talking to him about these things and his demeanor changed. And he had been combative, but then he became a little bit more reflective. And he said, you know what's missing on farms today? Pigmanship. This real understanding of animals. You know, I've talked to Temple Grandin about this too, who is a uh, livestock handling experts, designed many systems currently in the use in the U.S. And she says, you know, that, you know, farmers today and workers today on farms don't understand animals. And so that's what this guy keyed into. What's missing today is pigmanship. And then I was getting ready to leave and the last thing he said to me is, you know what everybody should see? Is a sow build a nest. And that's one of our guys at our farm with straw in her mouth building a nest. And they do this. These animals build nests. You know, sows in a natural environment will raise their young cooperatively. Uh, they will babysit for each other. They will gather together to fight off predators. I remember seeing something on the Discovery Channel a few years ago where you had these wild pigs, mothers and their babies, and this big cat, it might have been a leopard or some kind of big cat, came in to try to get one of those babies, and those mothers fought off that cat, and that cat was lucky to get out alive. At one point, he was on his back. So these are fierce protectors of their babies, which is sort of a natural motherly thing to do. Um, but on these factory farms, that is not seen at all. And it's actually seen as a, an obstacle, because these industries want to take these babies away and fatten them for slaughter. So when we confine animals in this way and treat animals and exploit them in these ways, there's a tendency for us to start rationalizing. We put the animals behind bars and in some sense we put ourselves behind bars. We start thinking things are the, a certain way and they don't have to be that way. What I think is important now is for us not to just be mindless consumers but for us to be citizens and to make mindful choices that are aligned with our own values and our own interests. And I think if everybody does that, we're going to see a huge shift. So I have a few quotes here that I like a lot. Each snowflake in an avalanche pleads, not guilty. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Now, there's a lot of things in this world that are outside of our control that we can't do very much about. But when it comes to what we eat, we all have a lot of control over that. And we can make choices that can make a world of difference for other animals and for ourselves and for our planet. And I love this quote from Margaret Mead. You know, the number of vegans in the world is pretty small today, but it's growing. And it's actually not a new idea. Pythagoras was a vegan thousands of years ago. Recently, people like Bill Clinton have decided that eating plants instead of animals makes sense. 
He was concerned about his health problems, so he became a vegan. After reading the books by the experts in the movie I mentioned before called Forks Over Knives, and his health has improved as a result. Mike Tyson went vegan recently. He's no longer eating ears, thankfully. <laughs> and I think with Mike Tyson, what's really interesting is that, you know, as a kid, he was bullied. You know, most people don't think about this, but he was bullied as a kid. He was younger, and older kids bullied him. And he raised pigeons, and he loved his pigeons. And then one day, one of these bullies came in and killed his pigeon. And that's when Mike Tyson became a fighter. And then he was mentored. He had good role models. He worked hard. He achieved. And then something happened. You know, he started probably hanging out with the wrong people. It started the ego, the money, the power, the greed, all that kind of stuff started. Hedonism, all these kind of things started playing in. Kind of lost his way. And I think now he's trying to regain his way. I don't know him, but just hearing his story, you know, it's, it could be a story of redemption, you know, being in one place and then coming out of it. And he became vegan. I think that is part of it for him. And then there's people like Ellen DeGeneres and, you know, more and more folks recognizing the benefits of eating plants instead of animals. And, um, and each person has to make their own choices. You know, as I say, I've been a vegan since 1985, but each of us has to decide for ourselves what feels right. Uh, but it's important to actually think about it and to be mindful about it and not to sort of mindlessly go along because that's what everybody else is doing. Because that approach has led to enormous problems over human history. I don't need to go into all the types of bad things us humans have done over the years, but in most cases, there's usually a rationalization of why we had to do it. People are very good at coming up with good reasons to do really bad things. So it's important to really think about how we feel when we think about um, our actions and the impacts they have on others. And, and the thing that makes me so hopeful is that most people are humane. Most people are compassionate. We have empathy. I mean, that's, we're hardwired to have empathy. When you see somebody else hurt, I mean, there's been science showing this, it affects us. And other animals, by the way, have similar capacities. When they see others hurt, they feel it. So that empathy uh, suggests our connection with others. And when we act in alignment with that, it's good for the others, for the other animals, and it's good for us. To that idea, all the animals at Farm Sanctuary say, thank you for being here. And I'm happy to take any questions anybody has now. So thank you all very much. So thanks for coming here today. I thought your talk was super interesting. Sometimes I hear from on like the other side that it's these industrial practices that make food affordable and that our population, much of the population can't really afford it unless we grow animals these ways, plants in weird ways. So what do you think about that? I think it's an important question. And the goal of farming is to feed our world. And the key question is, what is the best way to feed our world? And I've spoken at agribusiness conferences about this specific topic. And um, my point of view is that by growing plant foods instead of animal foods, it's a heck of a lot more efficient. To grow animal foods, you need to grow lots of corn and soybeans. Like 70 to 80% of the corn and soybeans, or even more, grown in this country is fed to farm animals. If we really want to feed people, we should be growing food for people, not for animals. Um, it takes a lot more water, a lot more fossil fuels, a lot more resources to grow animal foods. And I was making the, this case at a group of dairy farmers once, and they kept coming back to me and saying, no, the best way to feed the world is through industrial animal production. And I kept saying, well, all the evidence suggests that it's inefficient. You know, if we really want to feed the world, we should be eating more plants. And I asked them, where were they getting their information that animal farming was efficient? And they told me the name of the book. It was called Saving the Planet with Pesticides and Plastics. <laughs> that was really the name of the book. So it just speaks to our ability to rationalize and come up with reasons for practically anything. But the idea that healthy food needs to be expensive is another challenge. And I believe that right now, healthy food in this country is too expensive. I think one of the reasons for that is because the demand is so strong. And there's not as much of a supply as there needs to be. 
Um, but there's simple things we can do. You know, for instance, instead of grabbing a bag of potato chips, we can eat a sack of potatoes. <laughs> you know, but then it's a matter of new habits. Instead of just you know, getting something open and eating, there might be some food preparation. So it's new habits that maybe need to develop. There's another assumption that is, as people become wealthier, they want to eat more animal foods. And that has happened historically. Is that a good trend? I don't think so. <laughs> I think what it speaks to is with wealth tends to come greed, tends to be the desire to use more stuff. And I don't think that that's healthy. And I think you have people now who have kind of done very well financially who are actually deciding not to eat animal foods. You know, John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, for example, is a vegan. And so you have a very sort of strong market for vegan foods. And, and, the, and there are companies that are selling vegan foods at a high price because there's a strong demand. And I would say the same thing goes for um, animal foods that are raised in ways that are not as bad as the factory farms, you know, like cage-free, free-range eggs, things like this. Those tend to sound a lot better than they are. Free range only requires animals have access to the outdoors. But access isn't defined. So you can literally have animals in a warehouse with a small door that goes to a crummy little paddock. And that's access to the outdoors. And that's free range. And again, you have such a strong demand and such strong opposition to factory farming now that people are selling products like that and making them making a lot of money uh, by uh, uh, you know, exploiting that market, really. So, so the food business is evolving. Um, I think the best way to get food is at farmers markets. The closer we can get to the source of our food, the better. The further removed we are, the more chances there are for us to not really know what we're getting. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, do, do the animals ever fight? Like, I, I could imagine if you have, you know, bulls or something on, you know, even in the sanctuary, do, is, that, is that a problem that you... You know, the animals at Farm Sanctuary do sometimes have issues about who's supposed to sleep where, and so they will sometimes push against each other. But they set up their own social system, and they create their own mores and their own rules. So they do, they, they have very rich emotional lives and social lives. So yes, they will sometimes skirmish, but they usually work out their difficulties and differences. Yeah. Um, question, you were sort of talking about this a little bit. Um, what about what do you see in sort of the like the political side and the subsidies? Because I know they have a lot to to do with it. You were mentioning, um, you know, a lot of the corn and beans being fed to animals. We know there's a lot of subsidies going to corn farmers. So I mean, are there are a couple of things that you see so from the political standpoint, the lobby standpoint, that are big issues. Yeah. And sort of related to that, I guess we're in election time, so to put you on the spot. Uh, do you see the way the different candidates or different parties are addressing any of those? And, you know, if you were voting strictly on that, how would you go? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, man. Agribusiness is so entrenched, and federal monies and supports favor the existing system, the status quo. And, you know, I've worked on legislation for a long time. We'll continue doing so. But we usually can only make modest reforms. And we will continue working on legislation, but you know, I'm increasingly coming to believe that the marketplace is where a lot of the change is gonna happen. We see more vegan restaurants, you know, more farmers markets, community supported agriculture programs, community gardens. Um, the political process is so disheartening, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's important to be involved. It's important to vote. It's important to let our concerns be known. Um, but we're up against an industry when it comes to animal agriculture that is so entrenched. I mean, they don't pay property taxes in certain areas. They have prefer preferential access to water. Uh, then they can pollute it without having to clean it up. Taxpayers clean it up. Um, so, and there's not a lot of transparency. So I wish I could give you a great news that, you know, we got somebody in there fighting, but, you know, both parties are pretty well, um, entrenched in the whole industry thing. So um, I, I would just say it's important to let our concerns be known. Um, usually the lawmakers who tend to support animal welfare legislation and uh, legislation that promotes a healthier food system tend to come from urban areas. 
there's some really good things happening in New York right now, uh, dealing with the soda pop and, um, you know, so there's some positives. A lot of that, though, may happen at the local level, which could then eventually filter up to the national level. But nationally, you have agriculture committees that are co controlled by lawmakers who represent agricultural districts. And there was one, in fact, that recently introduced legislation to try to nullify state laws protecting farm animals, because we've been able to pass some of those in the past 10 years. So you have these federal legislators that are so entrenched, and they tend to have a lot of control over the committees that address these type of policies. So I think a lot's going to happen more locally, uh, and I can't really comment on who I would vote for, <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah. I have a question for you about vegetarianism and veganism. So you described a lot of how animals are treated cruelly and how they're killed. Now, I'm a vegetarian, and I'm trying to understand if if I'm a vegetarian and don't become a vegan, are, is there a way for me to avoid animal cruelty, or is it just a given that any milk product that's created is a product of cruelty? Well, in commercial production, uh, the animals are seen more as commodities, production units, than as living creatures. So on modern dairies, you know, the cows have a calf every year, the calf is taken away. Um, so in commercial production, I would say that cruelty is inherent. Now, it's conceivable that if somebody had a pet cow and the cow had a calf and you shared the milk, theoretically, that could work. But in a commercial operation, you can't have that calf there because they're taking some of the milk. And also, when a calf nurses, he nurses regular, like 12 times a day or so. And so that makes it so the cow actually produces less milk. What they do on modern dairies is they suck them dry, and then they fill up with milk again, and then they suck them dry. So that's the way to maximize production. So having a calf suckling is going to lessen the production of the cow. So, uh, but theoretically, a person could have cow's milk, sharing it with a calf. But a bigger question, too, is, you know, do we need cow's milk? <laughs> you know, we can live without it, you know. Does organic farming play a role at all? In this? Organic kind of falls into that same category of sounds better than it is. A lot of these organic labels sound better than they are. And, and again, you have the calf taken away. It's an inherent problem. Um, so it's, you know, it's, uh, that's what I'd say about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, so first I just wanted to tell you what an inspiration you are because um, I followed a lot of organizations, animal rights organizations over the years, and um, yours is by far, I think, one of the few that oh, actually treats you. animals as individuals, which is great. Oh, thanks. Um, so my question is around messaging some of this stuff, because being a vegetarian or a vegan, you tend to get a lot of questions. And one that I haven't been able to come up with a good answer to, it's sort of bizarre if you are thinking of animals as individuals, but the question is, if everybody goes vegetarian, where do all the factory farm animals go? Right. So do you have any suggestions yeah. about responding? Yeah, well, well, in our country, we raise 9 billion. So it's a huge number. That's more than there are people on the planet. So there's a lot of animals. But the majority of those are the chickens that are raised for meat. And they only live about six weeks. So they're, and they're being mass produced. The reason we have so many is they're being mass produced. It's not likely we're going to have a vegan world overnight. So the chance of having 9 billion animals at any one time is very unlikely. Plus, we don't have that many alive at any one time because they, they're killed at every six weeks. So you, know, you just do the math on that. There's only you know, maybe a billion or so, whatever it is, alive at any one time. So we don't have the nine billion alive at any one time. So, but change happens incrementally. You know, it's likely that, and we are starting to see, in fact, uh, that as people eat fewer animals and the number of animals being killed for consumption in the US started going down a couple years ago. Very positive trend. The market will respond. Producers will stop breeding them. These animals have been mass produced, genetically bred, artificially inseminated. So as the people start eating fewer, they're going to stop producing so many. A concern, though, I have is that there's also potentially a push for export. Like with the tobacco industry, when, when there was more awareness and people were saying, I don't want to smoke cigarettes in this country, there was a push to export it. And that's a concern right now. There's this push to export these habits. But, but I think that you know, in response, basically, peop the industry will respond to the market. And, and it is doing so already in terms of killing fewer animals. Uh, now, the export issue is sort of an aside, but uh, 
but the market is going to, I think, ultimately push the industry in a, in, in a better direction. And it's starting to happen. Hi. Uh, th first, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, oh, yeah. I went to the sanctuary and I really enjoy. Oh, great. Uh, I took my daughter. Great. Uh, a question that I have is, there are many organizations that take care of animals, but I never saw on TV a good commercial that actually explain what we have to say. Is there a reason for this? Well, one of the reasons that we don't have television commercials with our message out far and wide is it costs so much. Um, you know, we've worked on campaigns to ban certain cruel practices. We've done this through the initiative process where we get commercials on television for like about a three week period of time. And it will cost millions of dollars, but it's a very focused effort. Meanwhile, McDonald's and the dairy industry and all fast food businesses are pushing their message over and over again. We're just not able to compete financially. So we need to figure out how to get our message out uh, far and wide, inexpensively and efficiently. And I think that's where a place like Google <laughs> or the internet you know, is an enormous new tool. And that's another thing that gives me great hope for change. Because with education and awareness comes change. Uh, but we're just not able to afford it, is sort of the simple answer to that question, why we don't have these commercials all over the place. Sure. All right. Well, any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you all so much. I'm happy to answer any more questions if you have them and sign books. And, and thank you all very much for coming today.